while you're standing, take your Bible, Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 14. If you don't have a Bible, see Pastor McQueen. He's got some ordered. He'll make sure you get one. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 14. Good to see everybody here in the house of the Lord this evening. Amen. Ready to study the word again. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hebrews 12 and verse number 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Again, tonight, this is speaking of eternity. I want to make heaven my home. I want to make heaven my home. And I very well understand that these two ingredients are essential. Peace and holiness. Both are essential. You can't just have the holiness and you can't just have the peace. you got to put these two together. I find sometimes that some folks want the peace and some want the holiness. And some don't want the peace and the holiness. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says peace and holiness. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. Amen. You'll be glad I left you standing for a minute by the time I get done this evening. Amen. All right. Amen. Last week I kind of gave you a preview of what we'd be talking about today. Questions concerning practical holiness. We're studying holiness or being separated unto the Lord. And so this evening we'll, we'll start out with the first question on this subject tonight. Where does holiness teaching originate? Where does holiness teaching originate? If you didn't bring a, a pad uh, and, and some writing instrument or have a, a device that you take notes on, then I'm encouraging you to do that. Not just while I'm teaching this series, but that's, good. that's a good practice every time you come to church. Every time. Sundays and Wednesdays, it's a good practice. Amen. Every time you come. So where does holiness teaching originate? The supreme source of holiness teaching is the Bible itself. So the simple answer is the Bible. The Bible. That's where holiness teaching originates. This is important because we also call the Bible the Word of God. The Word of God. Sometimes just saying Bible, Holy Bible, sometimes that kind of lets us allocate the Bible into the library of books when it's more than books. It's more than books. I've got a library full of books. If you've ever walked in my office, I've got a library full that's in there, and I've probably got another library that, that full scattered around. In fact, that little black tra tra trailer out there behind the church, I filled it up when I cleaned my office up the other day. F folks thought I was moving out. I wasn't moving out. I was just getting some room to move around. That's all I was doing. So, uh, But it's full of books, and i got books at home. and uh, So there are many books, but there is only one Word of God. Let me repeat that. There are many books, but there is only one Word of God. That's what we rely on. We rely on the Word of God. We rely on that Word of God to be the final authority on all facts. It is the final authority, and we rely on it. When we're not sure what's right or what's wrong, we go to the Word of God. And when, we're, when we are, in, when we are in, in some dilemma or some... Uh, question is in our mind about holiness, the place to go is the Word of God. That's where we need to go to get our, our final authority. Holiness standard must either be a specific Bible statement or a valid application of a biblical principle. 
Now that's important. That's important. It must either be a verbatim statement, actual statement that identifies and defines the holiness standard, or it must fall under the category of a sound application of a biblical principle. Now, there are many things that we do because they are expressly written in the Word of God. There are other things that we do because they fall under a practical application of a biblical principle. And they are both very important. They are very important. I have had a lot of people tell me over my life as a believer, well, that's not written in the Bible. And it may not be written in the Bible in the exact terms. For example, there's no scripture that says, Thou shalt not be a practicer of the consumption of pornography. Can't find it. But it falls under the practice of a sound biblical principle in that we are instructed not to fall into lasciviousness nor evil lust nor any such thing. So you see the principle, the principle is applied to an evil practice or evil activity. And they are both very important. God has also given us spiritual leadership. Pastors, teachers, God has given us spiritual leadership in the church to help us to first of all find and follow expressly written biblical principles and standards of holiness. Also to help us to apply biblical principles. Many times the pastor has to declare or clarify a biblical principle that governs and governs certain things that we do or do not do. That's part of his responsibility as the pastor of the church. He is to help us. He is to clearly sound it out where we might be struggling to, to know what we ought to do, to know what is right and what is not right, what we should or should not. Pastor is in that place of spiritual authority to make it clear what this flock should or should not do. Very important for us to remember that. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16 teaches us of the importance of the pastor's oversight and the pastor's clarification of biblical principles and, ha and how they apply to biblical standards. Without a pastor it'd be very easy for us to miss out on a lot of things that God wants us to get. Thirdly, so we've, the, the Bible, the Word of God, the spiritual authority, and thirdly, but also very, very important, is the unctions of God's Holy Spirit or the leading of God's Holy Spirit. God's Spirit will move upon a man or a woman. In fact, sometimes God's Spirit will bring a conviction or a certain feeling in, into, into your spirit about something that you have done or maybe something that you have not done God's Holy Spirit will prompt you, nudge you, or move you, even in
in some instances where you lack biblical understanding. In other words, you might say, well, I was doing such and such the other day, and I just, I felt bad. I, I felt bad. It didn't feel right. That was God's Holy Spirit prompting you. Now, if you want further understanding, go to pastor. Wave at us, pastor, back there. There he is, back there. Just so y'all know, he's waving his hand back there. Go to pastor and say, pastor, I need clarification. I felt something, but I really don't know why. I really don't know why. So, here's, here's the way that this works. First of all, God's Word gives us expressly written biblical standards. And then the Word of God gives us biblical principle. And then God gives us a spiritual leader whom the writer said watches for our souls. He gives us a spiritual leader to help clarify any of those things that we might not fully understand. And then thirdly, with his own Holy Spirit, he prompts us into things and out of things. God's Holy Spirit doesn't just work and say, don't do that. God's Spirit, Holy Spirit will also urge you to do things. To do things. It will urge you into practice of holiness standards. These three teachers, the Word of God, the Man of God, and the Spirit of God, these three teachers, they do not work against each other. They do not work against each other. They work in harmony. They work together to accomplish what God desires for us. And that is what Jesus said when he said these words. Be ye therefore holy even as I am holy. So the word of God, the man of God, and the spirit of God, they all work together to help you and I to arrive at the place that God wants us to get to. So here's what I would say by way of advice. Don't fight the word. Don't fight the man of God and don't fight the spirit of God. Submit to and yield to the word of God, the man of God, and the spirit of God, and you will be well on your way to becoming the person who is a practicer of holiness, which is worship unto the Lord. You will be well on your way to fulfilling that and arriving at that place in your life. Amen. Second question. Second question. The first question was, where does holiness teaching originate? The second question is, what are holiness standards? What are holiness standards? The Old Testament, the Old Testament standard was a banner. It was lifted up and displayed before the people, sometimes on a pole, sometime between two poles, but it was raised as a standard and it was put there as a source of information instruct and instruction. It was to help them understand what they needed to do and how they needed to do it. Still works the same way today. The standard still works the same way today. In Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, we read of an instance where a, ban, where a standard or a banner was lifted up. Dictionary defines the word standard as this, something established by authority. Remember the word of God, the final authority? Something established by authority. Remember the man of God? Remember the man of God who is thoroughly furnished, thoroughly prepared to be our spiritual leader? Remember the Spirit of God? The Spirit of God which is omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent? That's authority. 
That's authority. Standard, something established by authority or by general consent as a model or an example. Mean, a means of determining what a thing should be. Quite simply, holiness standards are not the tangible part of holiness. The tangible part of holiness is God's Holy Spirit that is within us. Holiness standards are the outward sign of the inward work. If Jesus is on the inside, there ought to be something happening on the outside. Anybody remember that song, If You're Happy and You Know It, Say Amen? Y'all remember that song? I can get some of you old folks up here to sing it. <laughs> if you're happy and you know it, say amen. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, do all three. Y'all remember that? What's the key word in all of that? Happy? Happy? That's why we say amen, clap our hands, stomp our feet, do all three. It's the happy. It's the happy. If happy's on the inside, happy ought to be on the outside somewhere, right? Happy on the inside, happy gets on the outside. It shows up on the outside. Holiness on the inside, a right relationship with God, a right, wholesome, healthy relationship with God happens on the inside. But you can't stop it. It's going to show up on the outside. If it's on the inside, it's going to show up on the outside. It's going, it's going to be manifested or reflected, represented in how we live. Holding the standards are the external evidence of an authentic internal work of salvation. Holiness standard or an external evidence of an internal work of salvation in our lives. Ask yourself this question. If I'm saved, what am I saved from? Well, I hope I'm saved from the curse of sin and death. Amen. I hope I'm saved from sin and hell. Amen. Amen. I'm on my way to a place called heaven. Come go along with me. Amen. Amen. Let's talk about three, three kinds of holiness standards. Bible standards, which we've already talked about, already referenced that several times this evening. Bible standards... Expressly, explicitly commanded in the scripture and demand immediate obedience. Church standards. Church standards that are established by spiritual leadership. Remember the man of God watching for our soul? There's probably not a church anywhere on the face of this earth that doesn't have some church standards. Just the truth. They may not be Bible standards, but they're church standards. They're established by spiritual leadership to deal with the practical application of scriptural principles in modern situations. That being said, there may be some church standards that apply to a particular assembly that would not apply to another assembly in another place. How could that be so? Because the situation in which we live may be different. It may be different. And so God has given the authority 
to the pastor, the overseer, the under-shepherd of the flock. He has given the authority to him to apply biblical principles as they are needed in the particular body over which he is pastoring. These are usually understood and implemented gradually. It doesn't happen overnight. I've, I've had some people that even questioned the authenticity of another person's experience in the Holy Ghost because they did not witness an overnight change. None of us got here overnight. Some of us get there a little bit quicker because of our heritage. If you had a godly mother and a godly father, whether you realize it or not, they didn't get where they were overnight. And if your heritage goes back to grandparents, I was telling my wife last night, was it last night, this morning? I don't remember when we were talking. But she was telling me, talking about her dad who's gone on to be with the Lord. And I was, I was reminding her of a story she told me. Now, if you ever knew Brother Nooner, you know that Brother Nooner was a praying man. He loved the Lord. He feared the Lord and followed after the Lord. But she told me when we had first got married about her dad driving down the road with the window down, smoking a cigarette. And a 22 bullet took the cigarette right out of his mouth. Now, that would be, that'd be a deterrent against smoking, wouldn't it? <laughs> High as bullets is and as many cigarettes as there are, I don't know if we could afford to do that nowadays. That's just, that's just preach and teach. How about that? Hey, Amen. We'll do it that way, all right? But I, I say that to say this. None of his kids probably even know that story. In fact, she had forgotten it. She said, now that you tell me that, I remember hearing that story. She said, but I don't even remember that it was about my dad. And I said, well, I thought to myself, well, I hope it was about her dad because she told me it was about her dad. <laughs> you get old. You need two memories to make up for one. <laughs> Amen. I'm saying, that, I'm saying that to say this, that Brother Nooner didn't get to be Brother Nooner overnight. It was the biblical principles, the practical application. It was an ongoing process. You've got to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. You've got to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. You don't, just, you, just, you don't just repent of your sins and all of a sudden you're spiritual from head to toe. You got it all figured out and you get it all right every day, 24-7. You know, you're that, one, you're that person. No, it doesn't work that way. We have to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. We don't get there overnight. We learn. Pastor has to preach it over and over and over again for us to grasp the application the practical application of biblical principles in our lives. Sometimes we have to be spoken to and then we have to be spoken to again on the same subject. We have to be talked to about the same thing more than one time. Anybody that's ever raised kids know that you don't tell your kids what to do and they just do it. You tell them a thousand times and you hope they get it right the, the 1,000th time that you tell them, you, you're thinking, I hope it sinks in this time. I hope they hear what I'm saying this time. I've already told you 999 times. And they grow, they learn, they listen, they hear. They learn how to apply the principles that you're sharing with your children Pastor does the same thing. He's going to pour it out. He's going to preach it. He's going to lay it out there. He's going to teach the word. He's going to lay the word on us time after time after time. But we've got, we got to grow in that. That's a gradual process. That's a gradual process of allowing that to happen. 
There are also personal standards. The third type of holiness standards is personal standards. This is something that applies to you and you alone. Now, somebody else may have the same personal standard you have. But sometimes even husbands and wives don't have the same personal standards. And for sure sometimes parents and their children don't have the same personal standards. Now we should all have the same biblical standard. And we should all have the same standard by the man of God that's given to us, church standards, practical application. We ought to be one body. You ought to be able to tell that we belong to the same body. But we're going to have personal standards. We're going to have personal standards that will vary. Just a real simple, just a real simple explanation of that is I only wear long sleeve shirts. That's all I wear. And it don't have anything to do with that being a biblical standard. And it don't even have anything to do with it being a church standard. But it's my personal standard. Furthermore, it's my personal standard because of a position that I hold. Before I held that position, I did not have that personal standard. I didn't always wear long sleeve shirts. I didn't wear tank tops. If you got any tank tops, you can throw them away. Be all right. Make car rags out of them. Give them to Brother Nicky. He ain't here tonight, but save them for him. Don't got any wife beater t-shirts, as the McQueen boys like to call them. Don't got any of those. Take that back. I got one, but I never, never wear it out of the house. And I don't beat my wife when I wear it either, so make that clear. <laughs> don't y'all get the wrong idea. I said the McQueen boys call it that. I don't. And I didn't buy it. It was given to me, just so you'll know. Yeah. But because of a particular office that I hold, I hold myself to a higher standard And it's personal. I don't ask any minister to do it. And I won't. I do it because I feel like God gave me that. That's my personal standard. Now, kiddos, just to young people, just so you know, I'm going to go ahead and put this out there. You may have personal standards, and you may have your father, your mother's personal standards. And because the Bible says for us to honor our mother and our father and obey our mother and our father, if your mother, your father has a personal standards that they've laid down as a family standard, that's your job. That's your standard. As long as you live at home, that's your standard. And hopefully it'll get down in there good enough that when you leave home, it'll leave home with you. Amen. You'll still have personal standards. Amen. Everybody should have some personal standards. And while they may vary, while they may vary, they are important. These are generally, these are generally prompted by the Holy Ghost. They are generally prompted by the Holy Ghost. Now, I have some personal standards that are part of my upbringing. I was just brought up a certain way, and I can't change. And they're personal standards. I'm wise enough to know they're personal standards. I'm wise enough to know that I cannot, I cannot require that of anybody else or hold anyone else accountable to that. They were part of my upbringing. And so I have those personal standards in my, in my, in my life that I still adhere to 
and honor in my life. And I will do that, I'm sure, until the Lord comes or He calls me home, whichever comes first. Amen. Amen. So these are prompted by the, usually prompted by the Spirit, but sometimes they are a part of our heritage. And even, even when our heritage has given us certain personal standards, just because they are not modern and they don't necessarily fall under the category of a biblical principle doesn't mean that they are bad. It doesn't mean that they're bad. You know, there are a lot of things that people say is in the Bible, it's not in the Bible. But did you know that a lot of those things are not bad? They're true, and they're good principles and good advice. So don't discount it just because you say, well, I don't find that. Pastor doesn't say, I hadn't felt anything in the spirit, but I was raised with this. Don't. Like the one fellow said, don't take the gate down till you know why it was put there. Don't tear the fence down until you know why the fence was put in place. So don't get in a hurry to get rid of standards that might have been handed down to you because they might be, they might be very good standards for you to continue to uphold. Amen. Amen. All right, number three. Question number three. Are external standards a type of Phariseeism, hypocrisy, or legalism? Jesus obviously had a problem with the Pharisees. But it was not that they appeared holy. But it was rather that their outer holiness was only a facade to camouflage their inner sins. Jesus didn't have a problem with the Pharisees and what they tried to do or what they tried to teach. In fact, when Jesus called them a hypocrite, and in Matthew chapter 23, seven times he called the Pharisees hypocrites. He also said this in Matthew chapter 23. He said, all therefore, whatsoever they bid you or ask you to do or observe, that observe and do, but not, but not, but do not ye after their works, for they say one thing and they do not. So the Pharisees, they preached holiness, and on the outside, they had adopted certain lifestyles. But on the inside, they were still full of wickedness. God is interested in the outside. But can I tell you this? He is more interested with the inside. And you know why? Because Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. The one thing that won't happen is he won't start on the outside and make his way to the inside. I've never seen it happen. God start working on the outside and make his way to the inside. It doesn't work that way. He works the other way. He starts on the inside and works his way to the outside. Amen. Legalism is the act of basing one's salvation on their own good works or imposing non-biblical rules to earn salvation. The Bible condemns this practice in Romans chapter 3 and 4 and Galatians chapter 3. However, 
The proper alternative to legalism is not the absence of God's law. It's not the absence of God's law, but it's the proper relationship to God's law. It's letting God work on the inside and thus submitting to God working on the outside. You cannot separate, and I said this last week, you cannot separate salvation from works. Because if it works, it works. If it changes us on the inside, it's also going to change us on the outside. If it works, it works. And you can't separate the two. They work together, hand in hand. We have, a, we have a relationship with God that's based on grace. But there are certain actions and biblical principles that God invites us and encourages us to embrace that are based on thankfulness and a true inward change. When God does a work in a man or a woman's life, a young person's life, when God does a work in their life, you will see change. You will see change. We're talking about that on the phone. Change. Not not the man you used to be. Not doing the things you used to do. Not living the life that you used to live. So... Are external standards a type of Phariseeism, hypocrisy, or legalism? They can be. But when they are truly practiced in the biblical sense, they are not. Because all three of these, Phariseeism, hypocrisy, and legalism, have their origin outside of the heart of man. Whereas holiness standards are birthed along with the salvation experience and relationship that a man or woman has with God. Why are some practical holiness issues mentioned less frequently in the Bible? Sometimes sometimes, uh, we can take Scripture out of context and we can even take Scripture Biblical principles out of context. There are many things that I that I have applied this principle to in my life. Let everything be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. I've applied that to many things, and it's a good principle. However, the biblical the biblical premise for that principle had to do when a man was found in sin. Don't let one person accuse him or her of sin, but let there be two or three people that would stand up and say, yes, he or she is guilty of sin. So we have to be careful that we don't try to apply that to all biblical principles because every word in this book is true. And it does not need a second or a third witness. Why? Why does it not? Because it is the, remember what I said when I started? The Word of God. God does not have to be corroborated with. God does not need to be confirmed. God does not have to speak in twos and threes for Biblical principle to be valid, applicable, and part of our relationship with God. All God has to say it is one time, and that makes it truth. That makes it truth. Now, if I say it, that's different. But all God's got to say it is one time, and that makes it truth. Question number five. Why do many external standards seem to affect ladies more than men? Some of you ladies have been waiting for this. 
Why do we have so many more standards than men? Seems to be that since holding the standards are reflected on the outside and principles often find themselves on the inside, but holding the standards are are seen on the outside. There are more rules that apply to women than men, if you want to use the word rule. Biblical word is standard. There are more principles in God's word about how a woman should dress than there are about how a man should dress. Why? Why would God give this seemingly imbalance more for, more for women and less for men? It's really not an imbalance when you really look at it because while God addresses the outward appearance of women more than he does men, he addresses the inward experiences of men more than he does that of women. So, men are stimulated by sight. Men are stimulated by sight. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. It's because men are attracted visually. And so God put standards in place to help protect our ladies and also to help protect our men. Holiness is designed by God to help offset the effects of lust and temptation. So God put in matter. Now, a woman, on the other hand, is stimulated by touch, either physical or emotional touch. This is why Paul said it's good for a man not to touch a woman speaking outside of his marriage. Understanding that this is a holiness principle, a holiness principle, a holiness standard that is given to men. So a woman is commanded on how she should appear or instructed on how she should appear and a man is instructed on how he should act. Let me say that again. A woman is instructed on how she should appear and a man is instructed on how he should act because of the opposite instincts of the male and the female. Thus, there are more external standards for women and there are more internal standards for men. In 1 Timothy 2 and 8, just before Paul begins to talk about some holiness standards for women, he mentions three holiness standards for men. He says, lift up holy hands or a body that's free from sin. Worship without wrath or a spirit that's free from anger. And worship without doubting or a mind that is free from doubt and confusion. These are holiness standards for men. These are holiness standards for men. Now, I know in this 21st century that we have to be a little bit more clear on what's proper attire for men than we used to have to be. Because this 21st century, the way people dress has just gone crazy. It's just gone crazy. It's just the truth. Men and women. Men and women. So this is why God put more in the Word of God concerning external standards that affect ladies 
than external standards that affect men. There are standards that affect both men and ladies, externally speaking. Amen. Number six, what happens to a believer who rejects external holiness standards? What happens to that believer? Let's look at five stages, five stages of a potential believer. Number one, comes as a sinner. Man comes as a sinner. Internal holiness, he doesn't have any. He just does whatever he wants, whenever he wants. External holiness, none. Absent. Status, lost. Scripture reference, Romans 3, 23, Proverbs 21 and 4. Second stage, an immature believer, someone who has just began their walk with God. Internal holiness. His, his or her internal holiness is present through the, through the justification process of their salvation. They haven't got it all figured out yet. They're just starting. But they're going the right direction. They're going the right direction. External holiness, not yet developed, just starting to develop through sanctification and through understanding of the Word of God. Future status, saved if they allow holiness to continue to develop in their lives. Romans 5 and 1, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1. The third stage or the third category. A hypocritical believer. Hol internal holiness, none because they're already backslidden in their heart. External holiness, sometimes they have good works that are maintained but are not accounted as righteousness by God because they are hypocritical in their, in their nature. Future status, saved if they repent. If they repent, saved. 1 John 1 and 6, 1 John 1 and 9, and Ezekiel 3 and 20. A worldly believer, a worldly believer. Internal holiness, present through justification. They may be worldly, but they got a heart for God. They're seeking the ways of God. External holiness, Good works have been abandoned by convenience and worldly acceptance. They've been unwilling to submit to the principles of the Word of God, the man of God, and the Spirit of God. Future status, saved if they repent and return to their relationship, former relationship with God. Lost if holiness is continually put aside. The mature believer, internal holiness, present through justification. External holiness, continually, daily, weekly, monthly, and annually, developing through sanctification. Future status, saved. Romans 5 and 1, Romans 6 and 22, and 1 Thessalonians 3 and 13. Let me move on to number seven. What should I do if I do not feel convicted about a certain standard? What should I do? Number one, carefully and prayerfully study the Word of God on your own, allowing it to speak to your heart and convict you in accordance with God's Word and God's will. Many times, many times, the Holy Ghost will illuminate our understanding through anointed preaching and teaching. This is given to us by the man of God. And when we receive it, God will clarify, clarify in our hearts and minds what we should and should not do. Our responsibility is to submit to God's word 
as it is revealed to our spirit. James 1 and 21, the Word of God tells us to receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save our soul. So carefully and prayerfully study the Word of God and carefully and prayerfully receive the anointed preaching of the man of God and carefully and prayerfully be submitted to the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. Hebrews 13, 17 says this about the man of God. It says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, that they may give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Strong words from the Word of God concerning a proper relationship between a child of God and the man of God that God has placed in their lives. Last question, number eight. How can I develop real internal holiness? The good news is, if you've allowed God to fill you with his spirit, you already have the Holy Spirit inside of you. So you already have the birth of internal holiness taking place already on the inside. However, we must allow him to reign over us or to govern us. Having received God's Holy Spirit can only be effective in our lives if we yield to his leading and his guiding. And if we do, then his Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. And as we grow in the grace and knowledge of God, the word of God will confirm what the spirit of God has already prompted inside of us. There's probably not a person sitting in this building tonight that hasn't had something revealed to them by God's Holy Spirit that did not have a true biblical understanding of why. But later on, sometimes weeks, months, sometimes years later, either through our study of the word or through the preach, the anointed preaching and teaching of the word, we were given understanding of what the Holy Spirit had already prompted in our heart. I've pastored long enough to have people come to me with all kinds of things. I'm not going to I don't have time tonight. I'm not going to take time to, to visit any stories, but I can tell you stories of people had no understanding of, of, of biblical holiness, practical holiness, biblical principles, but the Spirit of God prompted them. And then down the way, they were able to, to receive. Revelation by the word, sometimes by reading the word, sometimes by receiving the teaching and the preaching of the word. Through the Spirit's power in us and through the prompting of God's Spirit, we can learn how to live above sin and we can also learn how to overcome sin through the Holy Spirit, the power of God's Holy Spirit in us. God not only will lead us and guide us, but he also, when necessary, will deliver us. Probably folks sitting in this building tonight that knows what I'm talking about when I say deliver from the curse of sin, the power of sin in your life. Amen. It's powerful. The law of the Spirit does not destroy sin, but it overcomes sin. When God delivers you or I from sin, it's not the end of sin. There'll be somebody else 
behind us that will struggle with sin. But it gives us victory over sin. It's like the bird defying the law of gravity. When a bird flaps its wings, the law of aerodynamics enables it to overcome the law of gravity. However, gravity has not been destroyed. And if that bird stops flapping his wings, gravity will reassert itself and the bird will fall to the ground. Christians, through God's Holy Spirit, can live victorious over sin if they continue to walk in God's Holy Spirit and flap their spiritual wings. It will give us the victory over sin. I'm thankful today. I'm thankful for the work of God's Holy Spirit in my life. Anybody else can say amen? Amen. amen. Has, he, has he changed you through his Holy Spirit? Is there anybody here tonight that would say, yes, I've been changed. I've been changed. And you might look around and say, well, I've been changed, but I ain't been changed like him or I ain't been changed like her. If you're going the right direction, just hang in there. Just hang in there. We didn't get here overnight, and you won't get there overnight. But if you keep going the right direction, you're going to get to the right place. To the right place. Amen.